Hello and welcome to another video getting you the top grades. We're looking at the ghost of Christmas yet to come, and he represents a memento mori. This is a Latin phrase meaning a reminder of death, something really popular in Victorian times. It was a reminder to the Christian reader to always live a Christian life because death could come at any moment. Let's look at the first description. The phantom slowly, gravely, silently approached. Scrooge bent down upon his knee, for this spirit seemed to scatter gloom and mystery. So you can see immediately the pun on gravely. The word grave is in it, hence memento mori, quite apart from its sinister, dark experience. Remember, the memento mori was aimed at the Christian reader, and Scrooge uses this Christian symbolism by bending down upon one knee, as though before a religious figure. So in this way, Dickens presents Scrooge's conversion as a Christian conversion to good moral Christian behaviour. Now, if you've been watching my videos for some time or buying my guides, you'll know that I keep warning students not to keep using adverbs. Don't do it. Real writers avoid them. So, am I wrong? Or what's Dickens up to here? Well, the problem with adverbs in your writing is that they slow down time. You don't get to an ending quickly. But that is obviously what Dickens is after here. He wants to slow down the approach of the ghost to increase Scrooge's sense of dread. But it is also to help the ghost communicate, because the most interesting characteristic of this spirit isn't that he is barely separate from the darkness, as we'll see. In this quotation, it's because he cannot speak. Let's see what we have here. It was shrouded in a deep black garment, which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible save one outstretched hand. Again, you will notice the semantic field of death. Here, shrouded means, of course, covered, but a shroud is a covering that would have been put over a corpse in Scrooge's time and in Dickens' time. But for this, it would have been difficult to separate it from the darkness by which it was surrounded. Now, normally, we'd expect this description of darkness surrounding the figure to imply that the figure is evil. But it's important to realise that the Victorians had a quite different idea of death. This brings us back to the idea of the memento mori. Death, in some ways, was a positive experience because the dead person had a soul which would then be reunited in heaven with God. So to a Christian, death is bittersweet. It's the death of life, but it is the beginning of everlasting life in heaven. And so this shrouded black appearance doesn't suggest the evil intentions of the ghost, only that it is linked totally to Scrooge's oncoming death. All these words associated with darkness and concealment are Dickens' way of reflecting on the future. He's pointing out that the future is unknowable, and that's why it has no face and no voice. All this ghost can do is act as a warning. In this way, Dickens asked us to prepare for a future which is always at risk of being bleak. I'm not sure how we're supposed to react to this in a novel that's supposed to be about Christmas and good news. It seems strange, doesn't it, to have a message that's just there to scare Scrooge into behaving better, just to terrify him about his own death. That's not really a very big celebration of Christmas at all. It kind of goes against what we thought Dickens was up to in the novel. But let's take a step back and imagine Dickens' readers. That is exactly the kind of message of their society. It said, behave well, 
or go to hell and suffer eternal and unbearable torment. That's difficult for us because we don't have that belief, by and large. We think that behaving well is the right thing to do for other people in society. However, in Dickens' day, it was relatively easy for a Christian to believe that so long as they didn't actually harm anyone, they would still get into heaven if they believed in God and that Jesus died to save them. And because every other person in society had the responsibility to do the same, it was quite easy for a person to feel morally good by just looking after themselves and their families. Well, now you can see that that's exactly what Scrooge has been doing. He's been looking after himself, and so he might reasonably believe that his soul could still go to heaven. You know, if you count how many times he references God in the novel, you can see that he has a profound Christian belief. And that's why this idea of the scary memento mori, this ghost reminding Scrooge of his own death, doesn't feel out of place to a Victorian reader. Now, personally, I don't think Dickens is trying to use the ghost to persuade Scrooge to think about his own death, so much as to persuade us, the Victorian reader, to think about our own deaths. Scrooge, remember, wants to change the behaviour of his well-off readers in order to get them not just to give to charity, but to treat the working classes with much more respect. Now, the reason I say that Scrooge is probably not going to be persuaded by being frightened is that he has already met Tiny Tim with the Ghost of Christmas present, and I hope you remember he asks the ghost what will happen in the future to Tiny Tim, and the ghost looks into the future and says, I don't think he will still be alive next year. So for me, the moment that Scrooge starts to convert, starts to change, is actually in the previous chapter. It's not when he meets this terrifying ghost. And so that suggests that the terrifying nature of this ghost isn't really aimed at Scrooge, it's aimed at the reader. This next quotation is also evidence that Scrooge has already begun his transformation, his conversion into a morally good person. This is what he thinks. It gave him little surprise. He's talking about not being able to see himself when the ghost of Christmas yet to come takes him round. And he thinks the reason for that isn't that he's dead. He thinks it's because he's no longer where he used to be, because he's already a changed man. For he had been revolving in his mind a change of life, and thought and hoped he saw his newborn resolutions carried out in this. So Dickens makes it totally clear that Scrooge is already planning in the previous stave to become a much better human being. Well, all right, Mr. Sallis, if the ghost of Christmas yet to come isn't there just to terrify Scrooge into changing his mind, what is he there for? Well, for that, we have to look at where the ghost takes Scrooge. He takes Scrooge to visit the poor of London. The ways were foul and narrow, the shops and houses wretched, the people half-naked, drunken, slipshod, ugly. Alleys and archways, like so many cesspools, disgorge their offences of smell and dirt and life upon the straggling streets, and the whole quarter reeked with crime, with filth and misery. You can see the way he adds all these adjectives in a list here, that he's trying to create a disgusting picture of London. Notice that the description of the streets reflects the lives of the people. So the houses are wretched, that's a word you would use to describe people. The streets are foul and narrow. Well, foul is something that you'd use to describe a person. The streets are straggling, like a person would straggle, falling behind. Although people are drunken, he doesn't imply this is because of moral weakness, but as a response to their poverty. They're drunken as a response to being half-naked and living in wretched houses and in a foul area of London. 
they are victims of misery and crime. The area is also described as a quarter. Now, this didn't just mean a fraction. When it's applied to a city, it means an area. In other words, there are areas of London in which the poor people are funneled. The rich have space and green parks, while the poor are crowded into narrow, disgusting streets. Cesspools, by the way, are what people would use before they had indoor plumbing and toilets. This would literally be a hole dug in the ground, rather a large one, and you and your neighbours would sit on a plank with holes in it in order to relieve yourself. Now, this is important because many of the Victorian readers would have believed that the poor people of London deserved their poverty. If only they'd worked harder. If only they weren't so lazy. If only they weren't so addicted to drink, they would lead better lives. Well, Dickens doesn't buy into that message at all. He's saying their poverty is a product of their environment. And he's pointing out that children growing up in these conditions will hardly ever be able to escape them because they're not educated and their families can't afford to send them to school anyway. They have to send the children out to work or begging or stealing. Now, the ghost makes clear that we are all connected to the lives of the poor. So it is in this part of London, this squalid ghetto-like slum of narrow, dirty streets, that the ghost takes Scrooge to see four poor working-class people who have had dealings with Scrooge. They are his charwoman, a woman who would clean his house, the laundress who would clean his clothes, the undertaker who will remove his corpse, and old Joe, a dealer in second-hand items, brought to him by people legally or illegally. Now, what's significant here is that all these working-class people have jobs, and yet they still have to turn to crime to make ends meet, because the working classes are not paid enough. Remember Bob, who is paid 15 shillings a week by Scrooge, well, that's the standard rate in Dickens' time, and the point he's making is that the wealthy keep the poor poor. They simply don't pay them enough. There isn't a living wage. When we meet these four, they are a deliberately comic group. They are a deliberately comic group who justify to each other how they have stolen the dead Scrooge's belongings without feeling any guilt because he was such an evil man. They call him a wicked old screw. Dickens is probably also enjoying the joke that the dead Marley was dead as a doornail, remember? Whereas now Scrooge is a screw. They're like two peas in a pod. This humour all suggests that the scene, rather than being full of horror, is actually really playful. The real horror of this scene isn't in the morality of the criminals. They are, after all, very good-natured towards each other and respectful. Nor do they set out to be thieves. And this is why Dickens is so keen to let us know what their occupations are. These words are a quotation. He's not implying that the working classes are natural criminals. He's showing that their incomes are so small that crime is necessary. He's telling us that their incomes are so small that crime is necessary to lift them out of poverty. In other words, we, the Victorian reader, are responsible for their criminal behaviour because we are the people who will be employing this level of worker. Remember from my previous videos that this book is priced at one-third of a week's wages for Bob Cratchit. So anyone reading this book is so wealthy that they can spend a third of a week's wages of a normal working-class Londoner on just a book, a luxury item. The old man who is taking in all these stolen goods is, of course, a parody of Scrooge himself, who makes his money off the interest that poorer people have to pay on their loans after borrowing from him. However, this old man is drawn to criminal behaviour 
also because of poverty. And even though he is benefiting from crime, let's look at how Dickens describes it. The parlour was the space behind the screen of rags. The old man raked the fire together with an old stair rod. So he can't even afford a proper fire. Remember the description of Bob Cratchit warming his hands around a candle flame at the beginning of the book. These people are so poor that even crime doesn't pay enough. And so this reinforces Dickens' social point that his readers and the rich middle class like them are actually responsible for the poverty of the poor and the crime that surrounds them. Another reason that the ghost shows Scrooge his own grave is to deal with the theme of redemption. Now this is a Christian idea in the book which asks the question if you are a sinner who has committed sins, but then you repent and change your ways, can you still get into heaven? Now, Scrooge isn't interested in the idea of heaven here. When he talks about hope, he's not thinking about his soul. He's actually thinking about improving the lives of other people. That's his main reason for improving his own life, not so that he will go to heaven, not so that he will stop himself dying, but so that he can help people like Tiny Tim. In this way, Dickens appeals to his readers' Christianity, not to scare them with a memento mori, to do good deeds before their souls go to hell. No, he's asking his readers to do good deeds because that's the way to be out of sympathy for real people now. Spirit, he cried, tight clutching at his robe, hear me, I am not the man I was. Why show me this if I am past all hope? So many Christians would take the view that if you have committed sins, repenting is not enough. And this is because the idea of repentance is much more a Catholic idea. This is why Catholics go to confession. They confess their sins and they're given an opportunity to redeem themselves and still go to heaven. In the Protestant church, things are a little bit more obscure. Many Christians of the time would say, no, it doesn't matter that you've changed your ways, you're still going to go to hell because of the sins that you committed in the past. Now, Dickens wants to break away from this Christian tradition that says there is no hope, because that's not going to do anything to help the poor, is it? He needs the reader to say, yes, there is always hope, not just for me, but for the people that I help. And that's the reason we get this description here. For the first time, the hand appeared to shake. So this is fascinating because shake has connotations of fear and it actually suggests that the ghost is afraid of Scrooge. Now the ghost obviously isn't literally afraid of Scrooge but the idea shows a transformation and of course it's Scrooge who is going to go through that transformation in stage 5. The other connotation of a shaking hand is obviously to shake hands, to seal a bargain or to give a welcome. And so there is a sense that there's a real turning point here with the ghost sealing a bargain with Scrooge wherein he will choose to become a better man. Now, those are all symbolic. The main reason for showing that the ghost is beginning to shake is that it is now no longer so stern in condemning Scrooge. It sees hope in him hope for his redemption and hope for the change that happens in the final stave. Now Dickens is really keen that his readers don't misconstrue this and think that Scrooge facing his own grave is only worried about his own death and that's why he gives Scrooge these words. Assure me that I yet may change these shadows you have shown me. So if he was only interested in his own death he would be talking about this shadow. But no, he's thinking about all the things that are going to go wrong, especially the death of Tiny Tim, and that's why shadows is in the plural. 
When the ghost realises that Scrooge is definitely not just talking about himself, the description of the trembling hand includes this adjective, kind. So it looks now as though the ghost is mirroring the change in Scrooge. Because Scrooge wants an altered life and wants to become kind, the ghost itself also becomes kind. With this symbolism, Dickens is suggesting that our own kind actions are infectious. They will change the future, not just for ourselves, but for all the other people who also become kind. And that, of course, is the point of the book, to spread kindness. And so the key learning point here, when Scrooge is faced with his own grave, is definitely this plural look at shadows, this proof that it's thinking about his fellow men that changes the ghost's condemnation into an altered view where he views Scrooge with hope. In this way, Dickens shows us it's his most important message in the book. And it's also the message that Jacob Marley gave Scrooge right at the beginning, where he shows Scrooge the ghosts of all those businessmen who are desperate to help others now in death, but can't because they're powerless. So the ghost of Christmas yet to come brings us back full circle to the moral message that Marley delivered at the beginning of the book. We can definitely argue that this is a didactic text, a book with a moral, with a message that it wants to teach. So now you have all the top grade perspectives that you need to write about the ghosts. If you would like some more top grade analysis on this fantastic book, check out one of the videos appearing on the left or on the right. See you soon on my channel.